Okay, I think we're recording. Hello world. Uh, <laughs> I'm Christina and I'm here with the lovely Mauricia Rubenstein, who I believe is in the ASC, correct? Correct. Um, we work together on, I think both Power and Ray Donovan. And I'm really excited to have you here with us today. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we could start off by you telling, because I'm not sure if I've asked you this in real life or not. This is real life too, but uh, I'm not sure if I've asked you officially how you got started in this. Like what was your first job on set or how you got started working in the camera department? Just the no. Okay, well, uh, I didn't get started uh, here. I got started in Amsterdam. Uh, I have a degree in industrial design in Mexico City. Uh, after I graduated, I realized that there was no real future for an industrial designer, but I had gotten into photography, sales photography, and I had the opportunity to get a grant to go and study abroad. So I always had the, had the, the, yeah, the, the idea of going to study in England. So I uh, said I was going to study film to apply it to industrial design to do uh, observation of uh, people's behaviors to design. And uh, obviously that was not the intention. <laughs> so I went to uh, film school in an art college and uh, met my uh, former wife who's Dutch. When I finished, I went to live with her in Holland, and well, when we finished, uh, and that's basically where it started. You know, for a couple of years, I was doing so much commercial stills as uh, my own uh, um, photographic artwork and having exhibitions, and. Uh, you know, I didn't have any contacts there and uh, the world is very small and I first uh, didn't speak Dutch so people would speak English with you so much and then they would get tired and obviously if you were in a set they're not all going to change to speak English just to accommodate you. So the time it took for me to learn the language and make contacts and so on and I started uh, I started as a camera assistant. I worked as a camera assistant for a very short time and then uh, I started to get uh, jobs as an electrician. And uh, I worked as an electrician for a couple of years and then I became a gaffer. And then I finally became a DP. I always wanted to shoot, so it just took me that way. Um, and then what happened is in 2002 or 2003, uh, I was living in Amsterdam and I got asked to go and shoot a movie for John Sales in Acapulco in Mexico. And I went and I shot it. By then I was uh, divorced. I have two children from my marriage there. And, uh, uh, I, uh, one of the producers on the movies, uh, my present day wife, who's New Yorker, we met there. And uh, basically that, another job offers following uh, that movie brought me here. And uh, then it was a uh, start all over again uh, to get people to know me. It took a few years for things to start uh, working. And I was doing indie movies. And then uh, the indie world died. And uh, it was just, I, I did a movie that got me an Emmy nomination. And uh, when we shot it, it was not an HBO movie, but later on HBO picked it up and converted it into an HBO movie. That was um, quite, quite a big adventure. It's a lot to say about that movie. And uh, so, uh, later on, uh, my agent is uh, close friends with uh, Rodrigo Garcia, who was involved in this project uh, uh, in treatment. And I saw that on the credits, people were like, 
uh, Fred Murphy would shoot two episodes and he was gone and somebody else would come and do two episodes and they were gone. And I said, well, give me a couple of episodes. How difficult can it be to shoot uh, uh, talking heads? Well, it was more difficult than what it seems. But eventually that was kind of my big break into television. Before that, I had been doing small things like uh, Human Giant uh, for MTV. And uh, so that job from HBO followed later with other shows. And uh, ever since I've been mostly doing TV and every time the projects get uh, bigger and uh, the, the directors get better and, uh, and then comes COVID. <laughs> and here we are now. <laughs> and here we are now, yes. Well, when you look back at your career, would you say there were either certain people or certain projects that really shaped you as a cinematographer? Uh, yeah, yeah, they were. They were. I mean, first of all, one of the reasons why I wanted to become a cinematographer was um, I, I, I used to watch a lot of movies. And now I don't have the time. <laughs> I did watch a lot of movies, and one of my favorite directors of all times is Sir Kubrick. And I always admired it, and I admired what he did, and I, I wanted to, to shoot things like uh, for him. You know, it never happened. But there are a lot of things that I thought would never happen, but happened. So you know, maybe somewhere else, something else will happen. But um, yeah, there's a. Uh, I've been I've been lucky uh, to like to have worked with people who, in a certain way, uh, were very uh, relevant figures in the indie movie world. You know, John Sayles and uh, oh God, ah, there we go, mental uh, flat tires. Uh, <laughs> oh God! Uh, who's the director of Easy Rider? Um, oh gosh! E Finding names off the top of your head. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we'll 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 uh, do a little uh, a little uh, research here, but uh, no uh, people that I honestly have never thought or dreamt about oh Dennis Hopper, sorry. Just that little little guy. I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but Dennis yeah, Hopper. Dennis Hopper. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh it's there are a lot of people I've met uh, that I I'm all of a sudden in, in in shock to see that I've met them. Uh, and, but, you know, I don't say there's someone in specific who has inspired me and guided me. Uh, I have a, I have a very, uh, as you saw with names, <laughs> I have a very, uh, there's so many things I know and so many things that I have forgotten. So. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, I live more on the moment than on what I have in my head and what I've seen and what I've done. So I'm sure there's lots of things that have inspired me. And sometimes I can say something, but sometimes it's just there and it's organically coming out. Sure. Would you say that... Um it's it's weird to put it like this, but like in our world before COVID and now after COVID, you know, would you say before COVID uh, there were certain inspirations or visual references that you kind of always had in your head? So if you talk to a director, you could say like, hey, oh, this, this type of shot or this type of color is something I like. Or, um, I mean, maybe can you just explain that process for you of how you share some of your inspirations with other people on set? Uh, yeah, you know, there was, there was a long time where I felt like the DP was 
uh, in function of a director. Okay. And not so much that a DP was, or that the director depended on a DP or could get influenced by a DP. So um, I just, I would say it's not that uh, far back in time that I started to feel that I had more the confidence and the dare to start exposing things to directors, to, to start talking more with them about things that would stretch them further than where they are. Uh, I think it goes two ways, you know, I think you get, you get some inspiration or motivation from a director and then you react to it and vice versa. And I think it's there in those relationships where the real creativity and the real growth happens. You know, I think, uh, I think it's, it's also the, the question of saying to yourself, uh, it is time for me to I don't know, be, be more, uh, be more visual, but also be more determined about what I'm doing in the sense that not only creatively, but, but practically, you don't end up doing things that are just a waste of time. Would you say you have a specific aesthetic that you bring to your projects? Uh, I think uh, what I've been described as, and I consider myself that, that that way, is I'm very eclectic. So I've done very different things with very different looks. You know, I've done, again, I've done things with uh, two cents and I've done the same thing with a thousand dollars and uh, every time it serves another purpose and it's in another context. So I think the aesthetic is pretty much that. Uh, I, I have worked a lot also uh, having to match other people's aesthetics. Yeah, can you actually elaborate that a bit more? Because I know that maybe some people are watching this don't know, but sometimes if, as a cinematographer, you work on someone else's show, you not, might not be the like original cinematographer. You have to like match someone else's style. So I know maybe that happened maybe a bit on Ray Donovan, but if you could explain that more. That well, <laughs> it's happened almost anywhere I go. Oh yeah? You know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Gossip Girl was like that. Gossip Girl was much more uh, restricted. Oh really? That uh, there was a huge, huge amount of uh, uh, control to the, to the degree that, for example, if you wanted to move a piece of, uh, of uh, like a prop, they had to call the art director to get permission to remove it for the shot. And he had to say yes. Hmm. Things that otherwise we just do, right? Yeah. So uh, there were restrictions on uh, basically, it comes down to half light and front light for all the girls and back light. So they had to look pretty and no face shadows. 
no matter where you are, no matter if it's the other side of the, if the window is in the opposite side of uh, the room, it doesn't matter, right? But that's what it was. So, uh, would you say those, so those restrictions are predetermined by what the story is or just maybe like the, like the showrunners or the producers that are really kind of policing how they think it looks? The, the, the showrunners and the producers who want to keep the looks of the show exactly the same. You know, it's like a part of the brand. Uh, but, you know, there comes a new DP, comes a new operator, comes a new focus puller, comes a new director. And those things are not 100% ever unless it's the one single person doing it from beginning to end. Yeah. And then maybe even not so, you know, because I don't like, one of the things I don't like is I don't like to be a, a cookie cutter. I don't like to be making the same thing every day, cook, cutting the same cookie, bake it. Same cookie, bake it. It's just like boring, right? Yeah. So I, I, I like to evolve like, you know, I also came into power and they had done already two seasons and I came in on the third season. And uh, together with uh, Hernán Otaño, we had to start like from scratch because then we moved from an Alexa to we wanted to go with a mini, but there were no minis yet uh, available. So we had to go to the Emiras. So we were doing uh, operas in camera because they wanted the show to be 4K. And then uh, the rest of the operas was done in post-production. And we then had to go through the whole process of reestablishing, uh, you know, looking at the actors and uh, making match to what was before and keeping the, the style. And, and we did a lot of tests with uh, lenses. We chose lenses. We settled with these cameras. We moved the filters to the rear of the lens because we were getting a lot of flares. And that was one of the problems that stars didn't like flares on the, on the show. And so everybody says it's the same, but it's not the same, you know, it never stays the same. It's all the time changing, but you're coming in to, in quote unquote, match the looks of a show. And yes, you do match them in the sense that there are certain things you don't not do, you know, you don't, you don't do shots that all of a sudden you fly a wall of a set that looks like you're off the set. That's one rule. Girls look pretty, guys look rough. That's another rule. Those, those kind of things stay, but they're after, you know, I, I can say from my side, well, yes, there's that, but also there's other departments there and there's other things. And I find like when I came in on season three, we were a lot more cinematic. And by the end of the show on season six, for a lot of it, it was like going back to Gossip Girl, you know, wide shot, tight and tighter and move on. And so all that, all that evolves, you know, Ray Donovan, we, we sort of kind of, you know, Ron said a, set a start and I sort of went after the start and we if you see the episodes obviously you see what what Ron shot and what I shot we're not exactly the same but even though we had the same gaffer and the same operators and whatever we kind of kept uh, you know there's there's no a significant difference between one episode and another that you don't think like oh this is not the same show but it's 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 that it's it's the idea that you pick up something from someone but then you start to own it right because you cannot be that other person you, you cannot be thinking like oh how would robert would have thought that this shot should have been yeah it's just like no way no way you can't you know but that's where there was all the support of all the people who've been there yeah. before that make comments and, you know, 
I'm I'm always le- always learning from the from the team, from everybody on the team. It's not like I know everything. You know a lot more things about how to move things around a camera than I do. I, I, if, if you give me a camera, probably I would mess up, right? Oh, it's, well, that's a different thing altogether. <laughs> but yeah, but, but that's not my, you know, that's not my thing. My thing is to think in the bigger picture, to, to, to do, uh, to, to have a, a, a creative output, uh, to lead everybody to deliver that creative output and then to do that in the environment of having to deal with actors and assistant directors and producers and whatever, you know? Yeah, you can keep that job for now. I'll stick to mine. <laughs> well, you know, something I've thought about a lot is in the, the world that we used to live in, which was before COVID, you know, I think a lot of people in our industry as freelancers inherently are always just like, okay, on to the next thing, on to the next thing, what's next? And, you know, depending on your lifestyle, your family and personal choices, you know, we all have different ways to balance out how much time we need for ourselves versus how much time we work because you don't know when you'll get the next job, right? So um, I've just thought a lot lately about how we stay inspired when we are working all the time versus how we are kind of maintaining our sanity and staying inspired now that we're not on set. So I was wondering if you could talk about that, like how would you normally kind of take care of yourself when you work all the time versus how are you taking care of yourself now? Uh, It's easier to work and be on the set than be full time at home. (laughs) No, really? (laughs) In my circumstances, yes, you know, look, uh, I have a 12-year-old daughter and she's doing school from home. My wife works from home. She's a producer, so she, she doesn't have a schedule. She's on the phone all the time, you know. Uh, now I have a puppy. So when I'm working on set, I leave the house in the morning, I come back at night, I hear a little bit about what's going on, maybe through the day, I talk to my wife, I talk to my daughter, but you know, I don't have to clean, I don't have to take care of their dinners, I don't have to uh, organize uh, the house because we we had to do a total makeover so that the puppy wouldn't, pee and poo on the Persian carpets, you know, those kind of things. Uh, So I thought, oh, it's going to be a fantastic time. I'm going to have a lot of time for myself. Uh, I'm going to be able to watch shows I've been dreaming to see and I haven't seen. And I can uh, organize all my papers and my administration and and the truth is, you no, know, that all that has become secondary, you know. So yeah. my, and and then you know the union and the conversations of the union and what are we going to do and uh, not not only in a creative sense but also in a in a practical sense. So, yeah, earlier in the in the beginning of things, I was like, oh. I watched the third season of uh, Paper House. And I was like, okay, well, it's not the first season, but it's interesting. And then I watched the making of, and it's like, wow, that, that I would have liked to be part of that. That I found that really exciting, you know? I found, I found like some of the things that I find sometimes don't exist on set when you have the passion of a director fighting for something that is not happening the way he envisioned it, and a DP who's frustrated on the fact that he just cannot deliver, but it's not because of him, but it's because of, 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 of 
effects because they're trying to make this money rain and they cannot create the money rain they want to do. It doesn't look like the director. And, and everybody starts to go crazy on everybody and scream and cry. And, and I, I'm like, would be so great if we had that kind of passion at some point in one of our sets, you know, and not, not, not be doing things just like we do them so, uh, you know, like. Uh, are, are there certain know, directors? Mechanical. Yeah, no. Mechanical. You know, can you imagine, can you imagine on one of our sets, a director having a girl kiss a guy like 25 times till she finally kisses him in the way that he wants to see the kiss happen. And he gets it, but it takes 25 takes and they're outside in a sunset situation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, all those things are fun. This is, you know, it's, 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 it's part of the life. It's part of, you know, I, I couldn't work in an office. I love, and that's going to be now one of the things that obviously for a long time we won't be able to do. I love scouting. I love going to see locations because you get to places that nobody gets. You meet with people that otherwise nobody would meet. You know, and it's like, it's exciting. It's, you see the world, you see, you see past your three walls in front of your face. Yeah. You know? Would you and, say there, there are certain directors or maybe even location assistants or gaffers that you've worked with that have just been like so passionate, it's just so exciting to work with them because they bring yeah. that to set? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, uh, after Ray Donovan, I did this um, um, pilot for stars uh, and uh, I worked with uh, Charlie Grubbs, who's a gaffer. And he, he's like that, you know, we were, we were doing a pilot. We were doing something for the first time uh, together and something new. And we wanted to have its own identity. And uh, it, it, it was that, it was like me, throwing things at him and him throwing things back at me and it was it 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 was very creative and it was like you know it's the first time that I have a gaffer that comes to me and says I like to have always something white on frame white light on frame because you can put a lot of color but the only way for you to see the reference mm. about how warm or how cool or whatever something is is when you have a true white. And I'm like, that's an interesting thought, right? Why not? You know, we don't do those kind of things normally. So it was something new, something inspiring. And we had a laugh, you know, we, 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 started, to, we started to create uh, uh, some sort of jokes with light. Oh yeah? Because we, we were working fast and uh, it's a show where you have a lot of intimacy and you know how it is with intimacy. The actors, they take a lot of time to come to set because they need to get in the mood of what they're going to do and they are insecure and then they will, are going to be naked and how it's going to be and I, all, all that story, right? Yeah. So we didn't have time. So we were making jokes with things you know and then he says to me well i was working with this french dp that you remind me of and once the producer came and said to him hey what what's that light what what justifies what motivates that light and he says to the producer the same thing that motivates the music <laughs> 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 right so from that moment on you know we were having this personal joke all the time about let's do some music that's cool you no know? so yeah it's uh well you know that, that that made me think about 
how there's another aspect of working from home that you you don't get when you're working on set you're working around people is that sense of community the the yeah. jokes the morale the you know what was it like the seventh inning stretch you know there's yeah. these moments when you're like i can't believe we've been doing this for 10 hours and we still have half the call sheet to do you mm -hmm. know like those feelings that you don't you don't get when you're at home. Like we can't, it's just a different thing. So just curious if maybe you could explain a bit as the, the head of a department and as someone that's leading this group of people, you know, you're obviously dealing with a thousand things that we're not dealing with, but how you as a DP maybe uh, bring community to your department or think about your department. Well, you know, I, I like to, first of all, make everybody feel that it's, uh, that, that we're a team, that what we're making is not my thought, it's not my product, and it's not me. That it's the collaboration of all of us and the participation and the input, what is making things happen, right? And that everybody counts that we can we, we we ought to listen to everybody who's there with us you know uh me and anybody in 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 our department that there's there's respect and that there's camaraderie and that there's a positive attitude and that's what I like to inspire and that's what I like to see and you know every day at the beginning of the day the first thing I do is I come and I say hello to everybody personally and at the end of the day instead of running out to the van I still go around and say thank you great day to everybody and I don't do it from the walkie-talkie or anything I just want to I just want to make that presence and that emotion because for me it's an emotion it's a gratitude right of thank you for having done this it's great you no know, it was not easy and we were not all the time very happy right <laughs> well we're happy all the time <laughs> well we're happy and then we're not so so happy you know yeah but but we have a and and that's what i like to what I like to do and you know I'm I'm lucky I've been lucky that I've inherited amazing crews when I come to like Ray Donovan I mean it's very difficult to say anything that's not positive about you guys it's just really impossible you know no honestly it's just like I don't have to I, I, I don't have to come and ask why things are not being done or why things are not there yeah. or why someone didn't pay attention. Or You are all thinking about what you have to do and you're all thinking about me and you're thinking about, like you said before, I'm dealing with so many things. I don't have to be dealing with things that you guys are taking care of me. Yeah. I really appreciate that, you know. Uh, but again, you know, it's the tone and the mood and the resilience. And honestly, I, I really, I really like, I, I alternate. I have an episode to shoot. I finish shooting the episode and I have a break because, you know, I have some shorter days thereafter, but you're there every bloody day. The same from God knows when to God knows when, so many hours. And then some of you don't even live in the city and you have to go and drive and come back the next day. And, and for me, it's just like, how can you do that? You know, I couldn't. It's just like, maybe, well, if I had to, I could. But, but it's not just that. It's just, you know, it's it's even that it's just the respect for you guys showing up, you know. Yeah. It's 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 what a, pisses me off about actors, actors who don't show up. Yeah. 
and, and they don't realize that sometimes that can make the difference between you being able to go and sleep in your bed that night and having to stay in a hotel room. And it's like, your ego is not worth making somebody miss his own bed just because you had to make your phone call for an hour, right? I mean, you're not being paid to make a phone call for an hour. So those are all the aspects that relate to me in terms of, you know, I feel responsible for you. I feel responsible for everybody in the crew. Uh, I know there are disagreements and I know there are opinions and I know there are things, but you know, it's just managing it, smoothing it, it, but I think more than anything, just making people fee feel appreciate it. You know? It makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, I do think it makes it, a great difference. Yeah. It's yeah. a it's such a like a almost a like a simply sweet thing to say, but it's it's one of those like ingredients that I, I don't feel is talked about enough. You know, yeah. that sense of when you do feel gratitude on set, when you do feel appreciation on set, whether it's within your department, if it's within kind of the whole collective of the set. Uh, whether it's your boss or all these things, you know, it, it really makes a difference in carrying the day forward and you really feel it when it's not there. <laughs> so yeah. it's just <laughs> kind of wild. Yeah, and you come to all the sets where there's, you know, in power for a while we had a, a grip that would be very opinionated and would come to me and say, go tell the director this and then because we're wasting time and I'm like, Go say it yourself. You know, honestly, go say it yourself. I cannot go like that to a director because, first of all, the director is DGA, and DGA would say, that's not in the books. You cannot tell a director that, you know? Even producers can sometimes don't tell things to a director like, oh, you got it. Why are you shooting it again? You got it. You can't because they are the ones that take those decisions and you cannot tell them that they cannot do a shot. What you can say is, I'm going to shut down the set at some time, right? So get all the shots you want and let him deal with that. You can say that, but you cannot say to them, no, you cannot do that shot. Well, do you feel as a DP, you have a more intimate relationship with the director in the sense that maybe you can kind of pivot them or tell them like, maybe you could look this way and realize you actually do have all your coverage. Like, do you feel like you have to, that's something well, you work on? Yeah, well, that's part of the conversation I was having earlier, right? That there comes a point where you start feeling your own need to express your own strength creatively, right? Visually, not only in the color of the light and uh, the the, the concept of the framing, right? But also saying, well, we can do it this way, right? We can do it this way and we can do it this way. And you have it, it's, it's, it's difficult. I, you know, I, uh, it's, we're, we're, we're sometimes we fall in the middle of a, of a situation where on the one side we have an opinion but we don't have a final responsibility as a director has, you know. And the directors are being sometimes afraid about the showrunners. So, like, I had this incident uh, not long ago where we had a scene where somebody's waiting for somebody to show up on the street and then they have a walk and talk that ends up in the front door of a building and one of them steps in, right? And we covered it with a very long shot where you see them from the distance and they meet and they walk towards camera and then 
camera starts to go left along with them. And by the time you come to the door, they are in a, in a medium shot. And then we did a steady cam shot. And then the director says, well, uh, I would love just to have it between those two shots. But now what is going to happen is that the producers are going to be like, if we need to shorten this, how can I shorten it? So I need to give them more because the producers didn't want to shoot warners because when they shoot warners, then they're forced to use it all. They cannot cut it down. And if they have to cut third, four or five seconds and they don't have where to cut it out anymore, then they're in trouble. So we start to do a little bit of coverage and I suggest certain coverage that I say, well, okay, that part there, you have that. Now this part, you can cover it this way and now you can play. Now you can shoot. Now you can use pieces of what you had before. Now you have spots. But then you do that, but then it's like, yeah, but how about now the reverse of that, right? Thanks. And how about that close-up there? And how about this alternative of doing this here, right? And it all worked. It was all great. And it's a lot of options. But then you're one hour behind, you know? And so certain things there have to have to happen also. You cannot force a director to say, uh, well, you know, no, it'll be fine, you know. And then, and then the director is going to say like, yeah, they're not calling me back because I listened to this idiot, right? Well, that actually makes me think, I'm curious and I'm wondering if this makes you curious too. Um, do you feel like when we do get back to set, whenever that is, uh, writers and directors and producers might hold themselves more accountable for being efficient or for 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 knowing what they want actually like i know there's this 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 game right of uh, the idea that you have and the actualization of what you get and that interplay between well i think i know what this looks like but now that we're here well we could get this or we could get that but like i'm just curious like do you think that when we come back post COVID that maybe people will be more clear on what they want? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's interesting, I, you know, there's your people that come in there and they kind of just like hope that you know, there's all these creative people around you. It's like, yeah. well, when we get there, we'll, it'll make sense. Like it'll speak to us, you know? And then, no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that, could not happen, and I think some people will, but as a general thing, I don't think so. You know, we, we're going to have some uh, interesting conversations. Yesterday was the first one between DPs. Next one that's coming is between assistants, and maybe you know about it. Uh, I suggested that we have one with DPs and assistants and operators and, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the ITs, where we sort of, within the new rules, we try to just like structure the way in which we are going to be working. Because like yesterday, somebody says, well, okay, so when the assistant comes to change the lens, does the operator have to step away? Right? Those kind of things. and. I don't, I don't want it to deviate to things like, oh yeah, but if I fall sick and I get, will I get uh, sick uh, paid leave? And those, those are different things. Let's just talk creatively, yeah. you know? So we're going to go there, but in the same time I'm saying, well, I think that in this time of transition that we don't know how, where it's going to take us to, we have to think about transforming our language in a way that we can 
work in a more like it's not giving things away. It's not just doing things for everybody's protection of not getting sick, right? But yeah. In in a way of avoiding certain risks, you know. And of course, there were those who are like, "Oh no, 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 no! no. I, the show I'm doing, no, oh, my God! They said no. This show cannot be COVID-like. It has to remain cinematic." I say, okay, well, great. I don't think that the risk is so much on your crew. I think the risk is how are they going to do big ballroom scenes? Yeah. That's the risk. That's the problem. But okay, go make it cinematic for them. You know, I have no objection. And probably if I would be called to do it, I don't know. Then again, the question, do you want to go and do something like that? Or you don't want to go and do something like that and know that you're participating in putting people at risk, right? Because obviously they're not going to be wearing masks and the masks are not going to be erased, right? Yeah. Well, I guess that's another thing that makes me curious and critical at the same time is the the interplay between not only how we're making or how we will make things going forward but also the types of stories we're telling going forward yes you know i feel like there's just so much that's happened in the world it's it would almost seem so i'm not sure what the the correct phrasing would be but it just feels like it maybe be so ignorant to just as makers as storytellers to kind of like avoid all this life that we're living you know i don't know how we can kind of keep telling the stories like as if the world was on pause the world kept moving we just <laughs> sat at home you know yes well then then again you know it's like uh i know about a couple of shows where i've talked to the writers and i say so you're coming back, but are you writing in terms of what the moment is, or are you writing like if nothing had happened? What do and they say? All, they've all written like if nothing had happened. Oh, so, really? Oh. So, so how can we make those things happen? Yeah. You know, how can we make, uh, is, is the banality of an actor going to prevail after all this on going to say it? Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the, we're going to be working shorter days. Episodes are going to get longer. I imagine that in the beginning, producers, their brains and their hair are going to be in flames. <laughs> because things yeah. are not moving at the pace they would like them to move. Sure. Right? And an episode of eight days is going to become 16 and then 24. Yeah. Yeah. But You're just, I mean, it just seems like there's this logical part of yourself that hopes that somehow if we take our time and prove that certain systems work where we're avoiding risk, where we're still uh, checking off tasks, you know, accomplishing things that, then you're like rewarded with being able to speed up, you know, like after a week or after a month, no one's gotten devastatingly ill. Maybe we can work a little faster or something. Or, or once, once we fall into that uh, rhythm, right? It's, we're, yeah. we're, we're writing history, so to say, right? Yeah. So for the same reason, I say we're writing, we, we, we can give ourselves the opportunity you know, if, if, if you're returning back to an existing show, well, maybe you can make some small adjustments to diminish certain risks, right? But if you're starting something fresh, something new, you could be given the opportunity to create something that is influenced by what's happened and still works, right? Yeah. It's not only wide lenses that are good, right? We used to shoot a lot with long lenses because things looked prettier, right? You know, everybody wanted to have close-ups on long lenses because all the 
all, all, all the colors popping, you know, and all the soft backgrounds. And now we do it with wide lenses full open and, uh, and a two is not open enough. We would like it to be a 1.2 and then a 0.8 so that uh, we can defocus more the background and be still on the, on the, on the wide lens. We can change all those things, you know. We, I think, and, and I think there'll be writers who will be able to come and, uh, and and be more conscious about things, and producers who would demand more from the writers, or would take a different attitude towards directors. Uh, there's 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 got to be a lot of things like you know. Uh, one of the things that saddens me a little bit for the time being is to hear that productions are going to start aiming for local directors. Okay. So that, you know, There's this... Uh, not so much travel happening. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, well, I don't know. I think that many directors who are not uh, that... Uh, fantastic are going to start having more work and uh, we'll have to deal with them you know and you and i have had an experience of <laughs> dealing with someone like that right i don't know who you could be talking about <laughs> i'm not going to say names while you're recording <laughs> <laughs> well burrito before we lose track of the whole day i was just wondering if maybe you could say as we finish up our call yeah. Uh, if there's any advice or words of wisdom you could offer to either the younger people in our industry, people that are just trying to get into this industry, probably not a good time, but also for the people that are in it. Like, do you feel that as someone who's been in this career in this industry for a long time, you could offer any, I don't know, words of support? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think that those of us who are here, we're here because we feel something for what we're doing. We're not here just because it earns us a salary. Uh, I think uh, earning you a salary uh, on the long run is not going to be that much of a of a satisfying way to spend your life i think but uh who am i to say that uh i would just say uh be kind uh be true to yourself uh learn from what you can learn creatively and practically and use it to your benefit and to the benefit of other people and uh, hopefully uh, have a great time you know and follow your dreams if you have dreams i mean a lot of uh, a lot of people want to become a director of photography and uh, you know as you move on you realize that uh, it's a dead end unless you become then a director right so you come up to that point and then there's a ceiling and there's no more above. Uh, mm. They're bigger projects, they're bigger things, but those bigger projects become less and less all the time. Uh, yeah, well, if you like it, go for it. <laughs> That's great. Well, keep it as that. <laughs> if somehow you could keep liking it after all this, then go for yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time so much, Mauricio. I want to just sure. chat with you about dogs and cameras all day. <laughs> but I'm going to stop recording for those okay. who are like, oh, we're still talking. Okay. <laughs> Thank Go you ahead. so much. My pleasure.